This story will cover from then to now and next, all about change, how to turn losers into winners. No, he's running, he's off. Well, it's okay for now, but will he be back? Oh, that's a relief. find when I touch ground. It's a dead spot or something, but a bird that hasn't been dead very long. changed everything. To find a nest that had been predated meant that we, we were really competing with other, other beasts looking for, for nesting weirders. It's also one of the rarest and most threatened animals on the planet. The only place this species breeds is in far northeastern Russia in remote Chukotka and Kamchatka. And this is Arctic tundra, one of the most remote places on Earth. It arrives there after the ice and the snow has melted, tries to breed as rapidly as it can before it starts an 8,000 kilometre migration. The Spoonbill Sandpiper is the rarest of a group of species that migrate down the East Asian Australasian Flyway. The East Asian Australasian Flyway is a flyway that holds some 50 million birds that breed up in the Russian Arctic and migrate 8,000 kilometres down to winter in Southeast Asia. Those intertidal wetlands are incredibly important, not just for the spoonbilled sandpiper, but for the millions of other migratory water birds that refuel there. The very rapid rates of economic developments in North Korea, South Korea, China, all of these countries, mean that those intertidal wetlands are being lost. They're being drained and used for agriculture, industry, tourism, things like golf courses, a whole range of things. So these critical sites are being lost very, very rapidly. Putting conservation into action often requires very difficult decisions. Should we take eggs now or wait until they're incubated? And at every point, there is a chance that people will say you've done the wrong thing. Because you know there are some people who are saying you shouldn't do this and you're impacting on the population. Because the species is so critically endangered, then mm -hmm. you know, that criticism is mm -hmm. valid. Mm -hmm. But you can get a different kind of criticism if you didn't uh, do the clutches early incubation period and they were depredated. Yes. You lose the whole clutch. Yeah. I agree, and that's the tension, isn't it? That's what we've got to decide. Quite often, there would be a phone call back to us asking what's our suggestion of the way of dealing with a problem. You have to discuss it amongst as many experts as possible from a range of organisations so that decisions could be made on the ground in the light of the best knowledge possible. We had planned to collect eggs that had been incubated by mum and dad for at least 50% of the incubation period, but because of that nest predation, we knew that in future any nests that we were to find, we had to collect eggs immediately. And of course, by doing that, we might reduce the chances of those eggs hatching in an, in an incubator. You've got to make a decision, very often at a few hours' notice, that you think is the best one to deliver the result that we need, which is ultimately to save the Spoonbill Sandpiper. We 
we've just collected the first spoonful of sandpaper clutch. They're in the portable incubator, which is running at 36 degrees centigrade. That's perfect. We're going to transfer the eggs from the portable incubator into this machine. Before we do that, we're going to, to measure the eggs and weigh the eggs, and that information will help us know how long they've been incubated. So that enables us to provide each egg with the optimal temperature and uh, humidity for its incubation stage. 8.48 grams. Thirty-one point eight. So precious in the height, its length. With the predation thing, it, it changed, so it did mean that we ended up with uh, eggs a lot sooner than we uh, were expecting to. By taking eggs early on in incubation, we increase the chances of things going wrong. We were uncertain about the reliability of the electricity supply in the place where we were staying. So once we had eggs in an incubator, that incubator would have to be monitored around the clock. Nigel was pretty much housebound. He was just looking after the eggs, almost sitting on them himself at eight times. So one of the problems we have every day is a power cut. When that happens, we have to warm up the portable incubator and if electricity is off for a long time, transfer the eggs to the port portable incubator. So, the portable incubator just got up to 36 degrees C and the electricity came back on, literally just before, the second before, we were going to transfer the eggs to the portable incubator to keep them warm. Five o'clock in the morning. Don't know why I'm whispering because I've got to wake up Nigel and Simon. We're going to visit the nest that we've not been to for a few days and we'll find out whether we've, we've still got some eggs left. So I'll go and wake up the Sleeping Beauties and uh, start getting the ball on. It is uh, it's five, five o'clock in the morning. I'm going to wake the kettle on now. say is that is one of the most wonderful things I've ever seen in my life. It's always a miracle when a bird hatches but for it to be a spoon built sandpiper after all this time worrying. Just amazing. Holding a spoonbill sandpiper chick is something that not many people get to do, but they weigh about six grams, They're, there's nothing to them, and it's obviously very tired when it first hatches, and it's vulnerable to chilling. So what we had to do when an egg hatched was quickly get it into a warm place where you could basically doze and rest for a couple of days 
before it could get up on its feet and begin to feed. Another four more eggs hatching. Is that one of the longest days we've had since we've been here? Probably is, isn't it? It's because it's lasted two days. <laughs> yeah. The real challenge in Chukotka was knowing that we were going to have to do everything on the hoof. There was only one way to leave Chukotka, and that was by boat. And coincidentally, the boat arrived when the eggs were hatching. So we had to move the entire operation, incubators and rearing systems from our base in Minor Piglano across the ocean and a zodiac to a large ship and of course that could compromise the survival of the birds. We're packing to go onto the boat and the eggs are hatching as fast as we're packing. We just had another chick hatch, that's three today from two different clutches. We've got four chicks now feeding very healthily, very well. More eggs coming. Um, it's just very hectic at the moment. Maybe push out. Thank you very much indeed for all your help again, and we'll be ready by 10 o'clock uh, at the same place we've been landing before with the first portion of uh, cargo as agreed. Over. Roger that. Look forward to seeing you at 10 o'clock. Listening, channel 8 and 16. Good evening till 10 o'clock. We've been running around trying to pack up to take full advantage of the fact that the weather's okay to get these boats across and uh, we've got eggs hatching left right and center here which is fantastic but just adds to the stress a little bit Now down to destiny. You know what happens is happens, but it just feels sad seeing those young chicks, three-day-old chicks, got quite attached to them. See them every morning. I wake up, I fell asleep every night listening to them call. I want to do thank you for your patience this morning and sorting out the program here. This is history in the making and history takes a little while to happen. On board at the moment we've got Nigel. Nigel from Swinbridge in the UK. Nigel and uh, three of his team will be travelling with us on this final leg of the voyage to keep an eye on the birds. We're going to transport them to Anada. From there they've got a ticket to Moscow, so from Moscow to Swinbridge. And we hope that it's a new chapter in the history of the recovery of the Springfield Sandpiper. I am absolutely exhausted. Last night we moved the chicks onto the boat and the hatching eggs, and the eggs that aren't yet hatching. Fortunately, the, the oldest brood, the first brood to hatch, feeding on the artificial diet, new hatched birds are going to need insects. Martin's on the mainland still. He's going to be catching mosquitoes a whole ball day, and maybe some small flies for the birds to feed on. We're going to spend two days on this boat, and it looks like most of the eggs are going to hatch in that time, all being well. And I'm really fearful of losses through dehydration, overheating, and maybe lack of food. Good afternoon, everyone. And now lunch is being served. It's 1.30 and lunch is being served. Bon appétit. Chukotka just buzzes with mosquitoes. But at the time that the chicks were hatching, just before the boat came, the wind got up and the mosquitoes disappeared. So we had nothing in the way of live food to offer the newly hatched chicks. We had an artificial diet, which we knew would work for the birds, but it wasn't going to be attractive to them if it wasn't moving. So we needed the mosquitoes to float on the, on the water that we put the food in to get the birds eating the food. So here we are in the spirit of Enderby and we've got another hatching egg.
Tell me how you felt about seeing that. Come on. I've seen the new life. It's it's most exciting thing I've seen in my life. You know, I've dreamed of seeing the chick hatched all my life. Yeah. Yes. And you saw it. You saw and it. now I saw it, and, and it was a not and it was a Brilliant. It is, it is more than any person can expect in their life. It is, isn't it? You're right. <laughs> say necessity is the mother of all invention well Martin's invented a spoonbill sandpiper that will feed from a stick well done Martin <laughs> you notice these have started wing flapping as well yeah jumping jump around Now passing round Cape Navarin, which is the most easterly point of Asia, the closest point to North America. The two tides meet, there's a tidal drop where there are standing waves that the uh, ship's crew have got to negotiate. You can hear doors slamming, it's the rockiest part of the journey. We just to clear the surfaces of the tables, benches, we don't want anything to fall onto the chicks which are on the floor. So this is probably the, the most unsteady part um, I've, I've travelled so far with the birds. Some of those chicks are definitely uh, very good seamen, sea women, whatever. You know, they had to, to get used to the roll of the boat. And you could see them just swaying, <laughs> but it didn't affect them, you know, they, they, they just dealt with it and it doesn't seem to have affected them once they're on land over. We should better get you as sure dry footed, but uh, parka and leggings would be essential uh, for travelling to, uh, to the shore. Blimey, I don't look good in the morning. We're at anchor in Anadir. I've had a couple of hours sleep at last. Um, I slept with the chicks last night. The 17th egg is now hatched. Um, so we've got 17 chicks, just three more to go. Well, the chicks have arrived in Anadir and they're in a flat on the fifth floor of a Russian tenement building. It's got a grey day today, lots of rain about and um, lots to do with the, the chicks this morning. So basically just keeping a close eye on every individual bird and just making sure that they're happy and healthy and reacting to, uh, to their needs, whatever that might be. So the lack of room we've got is the, the, the biggest problem. Not enough room for two people really to operate um, in, in this situation. 
was um, it was pretty difficult there. I felt I took a big dip of myself, but I was I was pretty tired, and Nigel must have felt worse than I did because he had less sleep for sure. Last two eggs have hatched at three o'clock and three thirty in the morning. We, we were tired a lot of the time, but because we had so much responsibility, we had living animals that were dependent on us to provide them with everything they need in the way of food and comfort, it was actually easy to overcome the, the tiredness. So just by being together, we were able to support one another and get the job done. <laughs> got tears in my eyes, uh, showing a lot of emotion at the moment, but... Um, this is due to Nice Jarrett. <laughs> nice Jarrett and his uh, cuisine. I just discovered the cheese, cheese triangle. Cheese triangles that um, he bought <laughs> a couple of days ago. Yeah. Right, that's that's an example of the soft cheese that Nice. <laughs> that's what he ate. <laughs> he just asked me. Ask me whether they're supposed to be crunchy. <laughs> uh, crunched it up and ate it anyway. Uh, this morning was um, a real low point for <clears throat> both Nigel and myself. And yet another night of um, staying awake, waking up, uh, just keeping an eye on the birds, but um, very restless. But. Um, Finished off the day on a, on a bit of a high, really. Roland and Liz have arrived with Lisa earlier and been introduced to the situation here. I don't know what they honestly think. What do you think, Roland? I think there's a lot to do, but I reckon we can do it. So just have to get started, wouldn't we, Nigel? Yeah, you've got some nice mosquito marks on your face. I can see they've made an impression on you. <laughs> I've never been anywhere in my life like this. Um, the power just went off, so. Just been closing these up and putting mats on top of them to try and keep the heat in until the power comes back on, which it just has, fortunately. Trials of raising birds in apartments in Russia continue. When Liz and, and Roland arrived, um, we started to hand things over, but um, we were then straight onto building coops. <laughs> So we're now assembling the outdoor runs, the place where the birds are going to live when they're 10 days old. And they'll stay there until they go to Moscow when aged about 30 days. The place we're being given to put the birds in is quite a rundown place. It's an ex-military area. It's very important for all birds to be outdoors, not just because of the fresh air, but because of the benefit from sunlight. The UV radiation in sunlight helps them convert some of the oils on their feathers into vitamin D, which they can eat or ingest when they're green. Well, behind me is the uh, rearing units that we've set up. We've got uh, four of them set up, so there's chicks in each one, which just leaves two chicks in the apartment. So uh, it's really good news to get them out, get the sun on their backs, and they really look like they're responding well to it. They're catching their own mosquitoes now, which is great news for me. I don't have to catch them anymore. How does it feel to get these birds outside? It feels great. It's nice to see them out and about in the fresh air rather than cooped up inside. Sun, sun on their backs. Yeah. Excellent. The wind in their hair. <laughs> well, we've been working all week, putting all this stuff together. We've not a minute to spare. We're so, so busy that for the last three weeks, just non, non-stop. And tomorrow I go we'll catch a flight to begin the journey home. So I'm looking forward to getting back. To be perfectly honest, in. Everyone back at home. It's 
So Martin and Nige left yesterday. Um, it's just myself and Roland left here now. Uh, Roland's out with the outdoor pens. He's been camping out there. So it's just been me and my little friend who's hiding behind me there somewhere. Here it goes. We have one chick left on its own. Unfortunately, its sibling died a couple of days ago. So trying to take really good care of this little one um, and make sure that it, it doesn't develop any behavioural problems being all on its own. Um, hopefully in two or three days time we'll get it outside and mix it in with some of the other birds that are out there. As soon as the youngest spoonbill sandpiper got to 21 days old, it would then have fully formed feathers and would be safe to be transported, so we started the process of bringing them to Britain. To do that, we had to take them first to Moscow to go through a period of quarantine so that we could be sure they were disease free and then bring them on to Britain. Stand up. People, were, the people here were on the plane getting the birds off. It was nice to see. So you just, you just want to, just want to see them now. Have, they, have you seen them? Yes. Are they alive? Yes. Birds will breed when they get to two years old and we'll hope to build up a captive population and then in a few years time we will be able to transport eggs back to the breeding grounds to rear on the breeding grounds to supplement the wild population. If we just end up with spoonbilled sandpipers in captivity the conservation community will have failed. We need to do a whole range of things in the wild to save the species habitats and to reduce the threats so that we have a wild persisting population. Conservation breeding is an essential part of the toolkit that we will use and it will provide that essential safety net so that should the species go extinct in the wild it can be reintroduced. But it's only one of many things that we need to do. What needs to be done now as a matter of urgency is to reduce the level of hunting in spoonbilled sandpipers and also protect the intertidal habitats used outside the breeding season because both of those could be affecting the death rates. We have a responsibility to make sure that we're not leaving a world to future generations that's totally impoverished in biodiversity. 
These things make the world the wonderful, the delightful, the inspiring place that it is. Birds carrying two gram satellite tags have been tracked along the fast East Asian Australian flyway. One flew 2,250 kilometers in one flight. They're also marked with yellow tags, meet ET. Hopefully, this potential loser will turn out to be a little winner. And as usual with nature, their life is in our hands. I'm Nigel Jarrett, Head of Conservation Breeding at WWT and I want to say thank you to our members and visitors and other supporters who've helped us buy some time for the Spoonbill Sandpiper. The Spoonbill Sandpiper will become extinct without your support. So far we've managed to do three things. We've built this fantastic new state-of-the-art breeding centre. We've been to Russia, we've collected eggs and we've hatched chicks. You've just seen the phenomenal expedition in the film just now. And thirdly, we've been able to solve some of the problems on the wintering grounds. However, we need to continue with our work. We need to go back to Russia and collect more eggs and hatch more chicks to increase the population size. And we need to work harder on the wintering grounds where we can solve the problems of poaching and habitat destruction. We know we can do this. We can do this with your support. With your support, we can stop the extinction of Spoonbill Sandpiper. And no matter how large or small your contribution is, it will go a long way to doing just that, stopping the extinction of this remarkable bird.